All right. Uh, good morning, everyone. I hope everyone is doing well today. Um, I'd like to welcome you all to this live session for Grad Ready, which is titled uh, Preparing for Fall for Master's Students. Thank you all so much for taking the time to be with us today. Um, my name is Sheriar, and I'll be the one giving this presentation. Now, um, before we begin, let me give you a brief introduction about this live session. So this session has been made up for all of you to give you vital information that we feel is the most useful in helping you prepare as you begin your course-based master's journey in the fall. So there's a team of experienced graduate students present here as part of our expert panel who will answer your questions regarding any of the content that we've covered today. So please don't be shy and ask any questions you may have um, as we progress. Now, this presentation is also designed to be interactive, so we will have open question and answers after we go through each of the slides uh, in the main content. Now, you can ask these questions by typing the question in the live Q&A section shown in the top right corner of your screen, uh, which has a bubble that has a question mark in it. Um, hopefully, there will be time for question and answers at the end of the presentation as well. Now, if we are unable to answer any of your questions during the presentation, please don't be worried as we will address these on the discussion board in the Grad Ready course on Learn. Um, also, we will upload a copy of this presentation to Learn, so if you need to review any of the material presented here, you can do that um, on your own time. So we'll start things off by introducing uh, your discipline specialists who are graduate students that are going to be helping you over the next few months as you transition to your respective graduate programs. So we'll start off with myself. So my name is Sheriar. I did my uh, bachelor's in mechanical mechatronics engineering at the University of Waterloo. After that, I started my master's in mechanical engineering uh, in May of 2018. I transferred directly into a PhD at the end of 2019 uh, my core um, uh, areas of research focus are laser welding and brazing of advanced high strength steels, which are used in the automotive industry. Uh, I was awarded the Canada NSERC Postgraduate Scholarship in 2020. I've also served as a teaching assistant for several courses uh, in the mechanical engineering department. I have also completed the Fundamentals of University Teaching program, and I'm currently enrolled in the Certificate for University Teaching program as well. So with that, we'll pass things off uh, to Julia. Good morning, everyone. My name is Julia Goyle, and um, I'm a current PhD student at the School of, of Public Health Sciences, um, formerly known as the School of Public Health and Health Systems. So I got my bachelor's in biology, a bachelor of science in biology, um, with a minor in economics from McMaster, and did my MSc in public health and health systems at Waterloo. So I am a recipient of the Sherk Bombardi Scholarship, um, and student member of, of the Wadley Institute for Complexity and Innovation and currently serving as co-president of my department's graduate student association. Um, I have been quite involved on um, student life on campus um, and have served previously as chair of the UW Graduate Studies Endowment Fund, senator as well as a governor on the Board of Governors. Awesome, thank you so much, Julia. Uh, next up, we have Chigar. Good morning, everybody. My name is Jigar, and I recently started my PhD program here at the University of Waterloo. I started in spring 2021 with the Department of Mechanical and Mechatronics Engineering. My research lies at the intersection of metal additive manufacturing and machine learning. Before I started my PhD program, I spent about six and a half years in the US, first as a master's thesis student at Texas A&M University, and then I spent about four years working in the medical device industry. And uh, before my time in the US, I got my bachelor's uh, in production engineering from India. So, and I have been an international student in the US and I've worked as an international in the US uh, before moving to Canada. So I have a lot of experience with, you know, the international student experience. That's it, thanks. Awesome, thank you so much, Agar. So we also have um, our expert panel. So we have uh, Cassandra who's joining us today. Cassandra, if you would introduce yourself. 
Hi everyone, my name's Cassandra. Um, you'll notice that as a professional master's based student, my uh, resume looks a little bit differently. So I'm entering or I'm in the middle of my third term, which puts me halfway through my master's of public health program here. Um, I was also able to uh, be sort of an alumni, which was fun and graduated from the University of Waterloo with a Bachelor of Arts in 2015. Uh, I am using the uh, Center for Extended Learning to complete some professional development certificates. And then I serve as a uh, MPH co-liaison um, for my GSA um, with Julia. Awesome, thank you so much. Uh, Naima is here with us as well. Naima, if you wanna go ahead and introduce yourselves. Thank you. Um, hi everyone, I'm Naima Samuel and I'm a PhD student first year in sustainability management in the Faculty of Environment. Um, I've graduated from uh, Waterloo with a master's in recreation and leisure studies prior, and I also have a master's of business administration from South Korea and a bachelor's of information systems from Nigeria. Um, so I've been heavily involved on campus, as you would see from a sort of the description of the activities I've done. I've worked with various offices, whether that's the student success office or the grad studies and postdoctoral affairs office. But I think my primary involvement was with the grad student association. I was the president and CEO for two, two and a half years there, and I've also been involved in the University Board of Governors and Senate. Presently, I am also co-chairing uh, one of the working groups under the president's anti-racism task force, and basically my working group is in charge of the educational environment, so we're looking at curriculum, pedagogy, teaching, and research, and trying to um, use an anti-racism lens to change things. And so I'm excited to be here and answer any questions that you have. Thank you. Awesome, thank you so much, Naima. Um, so we'll move on. Um, so, well, you're here. All of you have made it here, but now that you're about to start your master's journey, you know, there might be a plethora of emotions that you're feeling. You might be feeling overwhelmed. Um, you might be in the middle of figuring out how you're going to be moving to Waterloo, and you might be feeling a little disconnected. You might actually be thinking, you know, what have I gotten myself into? How am I ever going to get this done? And to that, we say, don't worry, okay? The Student Success Office is here to help. But before we get deeper into that, first, I just want you all to take a deep breath and first and foremost, congratulate yourselves because the fact that you are here is a recognition of your amazing talent, not just as students, but in, in a lot of cases as professionals as well. So with that, we want you to recognize that there are lots of resources that are available to help you. For example, the Grad Ready program has been designed specifically for your success. The discipline specialists that we introduced earlier, sorry, I lost uh, my presentation. Are you guys still able to see what's going on? We can see you are on page or slide nine. Perfect, okay, sorry about that. Um, so we as discipline specialists have been hired specifically uh, so that we can help answer uh, some of the questions you may have and we can kind of help guide you in the right direction if it's ever required. Um, so we're going to be working with you to ensure that you don't just survive but thrive. So lastly we want you to remember that everyone here at the University of Waterloo um, we're here to help you and we want you to succeed so keep that in mind. Now, the presentation content, um, this is going to be somewhat of a content heavy presentation, um, but this slide over here kind of gives the summary of what we are going to be covering for the rest of this presentation. And I've we've kind of put it together in a way where all of the points shown here are your keys to success. So as a graduate student, if you want to succeed at the University of Waterloo, there are a few things that you have to do. So we start off um, by letting you know that it's very important for you to know the administrative staff um, for the department that you're going to be working in and studying in. After that, we also want you to know that it's very important for you to know the graduate studies and postdoctoral affairs, which is also known as the GSPA. It's also very important for you to know the Graduate Student Association, um, which is the official representative of graduate students at University of Waterloo. Um, so they basically are here to provide graduate students um, with academic support, uh, social community, mental and physical health supports, legal aid, um, as well as um, advocacy and, and representation. Then it's also, you will already recognize that there's a lot of terminology that you have been kind of exposed to as you've started transitioning into your program. 
Um, so it's important to know what this terminology is, what it all means, and we're kind of going to go through that um, just to help you define these things a little bit better. Uh, then we're going to talk a little bit about how best to transition to your new master's program. We're going to work our way through a, a, a new graduate student checklist that we have developed. Um, just, you know, sort of, again, to guide you as to what steps to take as you're going through this process. After that, we also want you to recognize what the important new Waterloo systems and tools are, and we're going to give you a brief background of these systems and tools so you can start using them better. And then uh, if there's a little bit of time left at the end, we're going to give you uh, an idea of how you want to plan um, to handle your graduate studies and life uh, in the time of COVID-19. And remember, if you are unsure about anything at any time, you know, just feel free to go ahead and ask. All right, so we'll start off by getting to know the administrative staff. Basically, what are the key roles and what uh, do they do? So the first and, and, and most important person in this category is who we call the graduate program coordinator. Now, these people, um, they will be your go to um, individuals if you have questions regarding your program. So the coordinators are the lead staff person working with the graduate officer to support graduate students and their programs. Now they can answer administrative questions about admissions, forms, and procedures. After that, we have the graduate officers or the associate chairs. Uh, these are faculty members within the department or school who advise prospective and current students about academic and research matters. They are the administrative lead in your department or school for all of the issues related to your graduate studies. We also encourage graduate students in, um, in, in, in their research programs or their course based programs to encourage, uh, we encourage you to review the guide for graduate research um, and supervision, which outlines your roles and responsibilities uh, for the different departments, for the graduate officers, for the graduate coordinators, graduate students, um, and your advisory committees. Now, let's say you get to a point where, you know, you're totally lost and you're fully confused about what's going on. Um, now, who should you contact in, in a situation like that? Well, in this case, your graduate program coordinator is usually a great place to start if you have questions about your program. The program coordinators are knowledgeable about many aspects of graduate studies and are the experts about the details of your graduate program. So uh, now I'd like to take a quick opportunity to take some questions if there are any. Anything going on? I don't see anything so far. OK, so that's good if it's clear. If you guys do have any questions, we encourage you to go ahead and type them in uh, in the live event Q&A section. All right, so we'll move on. OK, so as we mentioned earlier, um, after we've sort of um, gotten familiar with the, the different roles that you, the administrative roles that you will be interacting with, um, the next most important thing is to know the graduate studies and postdoctoral affairs, which is also known as the GSPA. So the GSPA provides support to graduate students, uh, postdoctoral fellows, staff and faculty who are engaged in graduate work and research at the University of Waterloo. So you basically go to the GSPA uh, to get support for academics, for awards and funding. Uh, they also handle your records, which could be your enrollment status changes or course enrollment. Uh, in this case, what it means is you may need to go to the GSPA if you don't have uh, the prereq for a course. You could still be able to request um, enrolling in a course if you have uh, the experience for it, uh, even if you don't have the prereqs. So uh, you, you always want to reach out to the GSPA and figure out if there's a way that you can take a course that you may not be able to register in right away. Uh, also, they handle student experiences and professional skills, and, um, and they also handle communications between students and, and themselves. So, so moving on, we have, um, oh, before we move on, any questions about the uh, GSPA? If there's nothing coming in. Uh, okay, just so as a reminder, there's the Q&A section if anybody has trouble still finding it is is at the top of your team's window with 
two bubbles and a question mark in it in case somebody just joined recently. Oh, by the way, we just just had a question. Uh, can you clarify what graduate work means and does that include co-op related work as well? That's a good question. Um, do we have a graduate co-op program? Um, for the graduate program, it would be our practicums. Um, someone might be considering that as very similar to a co-op style. Do, uh, so what exactly would that include? So practicums, um, at least in my program, which is at the MPH, we are required to do a one term practicum. Uh, so it's basically a full time job for four months. Um, the reason why it's not considered co-op is because you may get course credit or paid. Uh, not all of them are paid. I see. Awesome. Thank you so much, Cassandra. Um, so I think that's uh, yeah, that clarifies that question. Um, graduate work could also include um, now, uh, Sandra, could you also answer this question as well? Like, are um, course based master students allowed to be uh, working while they're on campus? Uh, yes, so actually most of us, uh, well, not most, I'll say perhaps 50-50 are working. So for example, uh, I work for the region of Waterloo in public health and I work full time and then I also attend school. And a lot of people have some form of that as many people are entering from the professional environment and maybe going into the program part time or full time alongside work. Makes sense. Is there any teaching opportunities available for uh, course based master students or are those just for research based? Um, technically, yes, but no. Traditionally, uh, course-based master's programs will not be teaching, uh, often because many of our programs are online as well. Um, and so the, the PhD or master's research-based students on campus will take over those teaching roles. Great. Naima, do you have anything to add to that? Uh, yes, I, I did want to say that it does depend on the department a little bit too, or faculty. Um, for instance, in uh, Faculty of Health, there were opportunities for uh, teaching courses uh, at the undergraduate level for course based master students as well. So I think again, if we talk about contact points, a great place to go would be their graduate coordinator to find out what opportunities exist. But generally, most departments would allow course based master students to apply as well. And depending on uh, which positions get filled and which don't, there may be an opportunity. Awesome. That's very good uh, to know. Thank you so much. Yes, Chika. So uh, just to echo off of what Naima just said, uh, I attended my own department's uh, orientation virtually just this semester, and this was a common question. I'm in mechanical engineering, by the way, and I think it is, I think the most accurate way to go about finding out if you can co-op or not is speaking with either the designated faculty advisor or graduate administrator to see what provisions your department has made, because not all departments are letting graduate and secondly, just to kind of offer the international student side of things, because I know the, the rules are slightly different for them uh, in regards to whether you can work or not and what the restrictions are. I would recommend that before you commit to any opportunity as a graduate student, you are fully aware of if there are any constraints on that opportunity. And the best way to do that is speaking to an immigration consultant on campus with the University of Waterloo and I just posted the link to you know how you can go about doing that in the Q&A. Awesome, thank you so much. Agar. OK, so um, we'll move on to uh, the next most important thing that we feel you need to be aware of and, and you need to, to know about is the Graduate Student Association or the GSA. So the GSA is the official representative of graduate students at UW. Um, uh, their work and services are basically designed to enhance the academic and social experience of graduate students at the university. They provide graduate students with academic support, uh, social community, mental and physical health supports, uh, legal aid, as well as advocacy and uh, representation. Um, they also actively promote and represent graduate students' um, interests to the university administration and all levels of government. Uh, you can explore their website for uh, more information and you can follow their social media, um, you know, just for updates and things like that. OK, so um, a lot of you might be wondering about a lot of the important terminology that may have been coming your way um, and there can be some confusion here. So we'll 
try to work through the most important uh, terms that we feel are, are, are very important for you to know. So I think the most important one is matriculation and can have sort of like a different meaning depending on which part of the world you might be coming from. Uh, so we'll just kind of try to clarify that uh, on this slide. So matriculation is an administrative task where you are made active in your program. Uh, it takes place approximately six weeks before the term begins. And in order for you to be matriculated, you must have satisfied all of your conditions of admission. Now, your conditions of admission are listed in your offer of admission, which is found in Quest. And the due dates that are listed with the conditions, they can only be found in Quest as well. Now, you do need to want to be aware of the fact that the due dates need to be met um, and, and all the conditions need to be satisfied well before the start of the term. Now, once you've matriculated, you'll have access to uh, the University of Waterloo systems, um, such as your official U Waterloo email, and you will then gain the ability to enroll in courses, uh, which happens during the class enrollment period, which will also be in Quest. Um, now, the other important term that we feel you need to know is uh, what we call fees arranged. Now, being fees arranged means that you have shown the university your intent to cover your fees for the term. Now, you do this by making a commitment to pay all the fees charged to your student account, which allows you to become a fully registered student for the term. Now, you must become fees arranged for each term once you are fully matriculated. So you can't just, you don't just do it once, but you have to do it every single term that you are enrolled in your program. Uh, if students are unable to become fees arranged on time, they may lose their ability to enroll courses and they may be charged a late fee as well. So another term which is important is what we call the promissory note. Uh, the promissory note is the way for you to become fees arranged and you do this by submitting your promissory note um, on Quest, which is basically your commitment from you that you will be paying your fees on time. Now, the promissory note just allows you to become fees arranged without paying the entire balance that you're owing on your account. The promissory note process allows you to leave a balance owing on your student account that is equal to the amount of the financial aid that you will be receiving during the term. Um, so for the promissory note itself, each department may have a different way in which the promissory note is submitted. So if you again have questions or concerns uh, regarding the promissory note, uh, you definitely want to reach out to your department graduate coordinator uh, and clarify it with them. Now it is important to, to note that your promissory note and payment of any remaining balance is due by the due date so that you are not charged a late fee. And lastly, we have the open class enrollment period, which is the period where graduate students are able to enroll in their classes uh, using Quest. And if you had to drop some classes as well, you can do so within this period also. Um, so are there any questions about uh, the terminology that we've covered on this slide? Sherry, uh, yes. Right after you started this last phase, we had a bunch of questions come in. Are you good to take some of them now or do you want to stick to just questions about this stuff? Um, I think if we've moved on, we might we can we can try to come back to this at the end. Uh, if there okay. are questions regarding content that we've already kind of moved past, let's let's uh, let's keep it slide by slide for now. Sure. OK. So do we have any questions for this? OK, I'm not sure. I think this is loosely related, but. I am if somebody is unable to access Quest. And what are their options? So um, they should are they because they cannot. Um, you need to have access to Quest to accept your offer of admission. So if you haven't been able to accept your offer of admission and you're still have you're still struggling to get into Quest, then the, the best thing that you can do is reach out to IST and have them sort that out. Um, so okay. if you want, you can just uh, add a link to the IST help desk, um, sending them an email and basically telling them what your problem is should help uh, sort that out. OK, I will post the link shortly. Awesome. So I, I do see a comment here that says, could the relevant links be put into the chat? Um, for all of uh, all of you who may want to go through these uh, these links at a later time, uh, the, the presentation slides actually have the links embedded in them. So 
anything which is blue um, uh, in color, if you go and click on it, it will take you to the link uh, for that particular point. So um, that should help you as well later on when you're uh, um, going through this. I have been posting links to any questions that can be answered with a link. I, I wonder if it does not show for anybody else except for the person asking the question. I think you may want to publish the question. Yeah, so I'll publish the question and then put the link on. Okay. Right. I think that's the way that it would show up. Uh, okay. Okay. There's another question here that says, "How can we know that we are matriculated in Quest?" Well, as as I mentioned earlier, for you to know that you are matriculated, um, you will basically. I don't think that there is a there is a thing that ends up showing up in Quest that that says that you're fully matriculated. There might be. But another way of double checking this is that uh, once you're fully matriculated, you will then have access to other systems. So for example, you will then be able to access your uWaterloo email and you'll be able to access other systems within uh, the uWaterloo uh, um, uh, ecosystem. So you should, be, you should be good to go with that. Um, I see another question over here that says I've already paid full tuition fees for the first term and I'm also matriculated, but it is still showing as not fees arranged. Will the paid fees be considered a bit later? So usually um, in Canada, in, in any case where you are um, transferring funds, you want to give two to three business days before um, your payments are processed. If it hasn't been processed in two to three business days, then I would recommend reaching out um, reaching out to, you know, um, the financial aid department and, um, and kind of double checking with them if, uh, if finances have been paid, uh, paid. If someone wants to clarify here, which department should they be reaching out to, to, uh, to check for this? So we can double check this and we can get back to you guys. Okay. So. We'll move on. Um, all right, so this slide over here basically um, talks about transitioning to your uh, course-based master's program. So there are a few things that you want to keep in mind as you start this program. Um, now, whether you're continuing straight from an undergraduate program or you're returning after building a career, um, you may expect that your graduate program will be a continuation of a similar continuation of what you experienced in your undergraduate program, because after all, your program continues to be course based. So just in reality, though, your graduate program is not just simply a continuation of your undergraduate degree. And there are a few key differences to be aware of as you transition into your course based masters um, or graduate diploma program. So first and foremost, you can expect your courses to be more intensive. Now, a full-time course load at the master's level is generally more intensive than a full-time course load at the undergraduate level. Remember, your expectations are higher for the number of readings you're assigned, for the level of your engagement with the discussions and course material, and the length and quality of your papers or assignments. Now, you want to keep these higher expectations in mind as you plan your course load and your time. If you're unsure what is considered a full or part-time course load in your department, department, again, you want to check in with your graduate program coordinator and they will, more, they will definitely be able to answer that question for you. Now, another thing you want to remember is that your proven strategies might need adjustments. So stuff that worked for you um, in your undergrad may not necessarily work for you in your master's program. So remember that you know, expectations shift when you move into a master's program um, so your study and writing strategies might also need to adjust. Um, you may um, no longer be able to complete your course readings just the day before your class. Um, and you know, uh, writing a thesis or your, um, your master's research proposal may require different approaches to, to spread out the work and avoid burnout. So you want to be flexible and you want to adjust your strategies if they no longer work for you. Lastly, it's still important to get involved. You, um, you know, just like during your undergrad, it's important to remember that there are continuing benefits of getting involved in activities and initiatives beyond your coursework. So at the master's level, uh, oops, I think I lost. Uh, 
Okay, so at the master's level, it can be easy to say, you know what, it's just one year, it's just two years, and you know, I can just focus uh, on my coursework without exploring additional opportunities. But you know, as, as graduate students who are experienced and who've been doing this for a while, we definitely encourage you to spend time developing your professional skills, um, joining committees, getting involved with your graduate student association, and attending talks and events. Because exploring these opportunities for professional development early on in your program will leave you better prepared for whatever is coming next. Um, so any questions about some of the content that we have covered here, we may be able to take one or two questions here. And uh, Naima and Cassandra, feel free to jump in if you guys have anything to add um, to what I've already covered here. I was uh, just going to jump in, sorry, and yeah, add because I see the question there and someone's asking about how to get involved. And I think you addressed that already, but I'm just going to add to that. I think there's multiple opportunities to be involved and it's important that you sort of also bring in what your perspective is in terms of the rationale for getting involved. Like a lot of students want to get involved because they want to keep busy or they want to build professional networks. Sometimes it's just about giving back to the community. So I'd highly encourage you to think about why you want to get involved and that will sort of guide you into what opportunities you should be looking for. So for instance, if you're looking to build professional networks, um, it might be better for you to look at um, applying for jobs in, on the university campus. Um, there was an earlier question on that too. There are lots of part-time opportunities, whether that's with food services or offices like the Student Success Office. Even within your own faculty and department, there are part-time opportunities for students, graduate students uh, that course-based master students can also take. Um, but if you're really interested in contributing, and, and sorry, I'll go back. If you're interested in the networking piece, you might also consider sitting on committees and contributing that way because when you serve on committees, whether that's at your department level or the university level, you get to interact with people from various walks of life and you can sort of build those networks. But um, if you're really looking to give back to the community, there are volunteer opportunities on campus outside of serving on committees. You can get involved in clubs. You can also look at volunteer work within the city, not just at the University of Waterloo. Um, and again, the Graduate Student Association is a great place to start if you're interested in improving the grad experience. Um, if you get involved with the GSA, you can really start to uh, provide that feedback on what can be done to improve sort of like uh, the supports and services that are offered to graduate students. Um, yeah, that's all I wanted to add and I'll leave awesome. it to the other. Awesome, thank you so much. Uh, Jigar, I think you had something to say as well. Uh, no, I. I see a lot of questions about what is the general advice if you need help in selecting courses. So I've seen that in a, in a couple of questions directly or indirectly. So if, if you guys want to address that. So I think the first line of action is definitely to reach out to your graduate coordinator. And then I think there is a, a graduate course list that gets published um, every term. So if you want to maybe provide a link for that, um, the students can actually go in um, and go through. So I, I do believe that the course list, um, the courses are finalized for next term, but who's teaching them isn't finalized yet. So you should still be able to go in. If you can log, I, I think there's a login for that. If you can log in, then you should be able to see what courses in your department are being offered. And if you want to take courses outside of your department, that is also a possibility as a graduate student. You just have to touch base with your graduate coordinator um, and work with them to figure out how you can do that. Uh, so I, I think Cassandra wanted to add something to that as well. Yeah, um, so I just wanted to address the the transitioning into a course based masters. Um, as you said, you know, a lot of us are coming from professional environments where maybe we've been working for some years. For some, it may be more than just a few. Um, and I would say that there are lots of resources available and things like career services, the Center for Extended Learning. Um, they offer really great workshops. You can go to a workshop that is about time management while having a full time job um, and that also you can use services like the Writing Center. I highly, highly recommend if you're going to be writing and you haven't done academic writing in a little while. Um, some of those things can be very overwhelming and can be very scary in the first few weeks of a new program and knowing that there's support on campus, knowing that there are people that are there for you and have done exactly what you've done before can be really, really helpful. Awesome. Thank you so much, Cassandra. OK, so we will move on. OK, so now we come to the, the part of this presentation where we're kind of going to work through this uh, new graduate student checklist that, that we have put together, 
which kind of helps you understand the progression of how you should be doing things um, when you get here, right? So um, we basically have developed a good idea of the important people that we should be knowing. Um, we know some uh, some of the important terms uh, and what they mean. And, you know, we've also kind of gone through what, uh, what the best practices are to best prepare for a transition into your program. So now let's just go over this checklist and, and you know, kind of see how we want to progress through this. So um, first, what should you be doing after you receive your offer? Well, obviously you want to start off by accepting your offer and, uh, and then you want to review your conditions of admission and their due dates and you can do this in Quest. Um, after that, you want to start working towards satisfying your conditions of admission as soon as possible, uh, and you want to do this at least by the due date, uh, if not sooner. Okay, uh, here's a very important one. You also want to enroll in the university's two-factor authentication or 2FA uh, service, which is powered by Duo. Uh, you, you will not be able uh, to access University of Waterloo systems, uh, including Learn, Email, or Quest, without enrolling in 2FA. So for any of those who uh, have been having these issues with you know, uh, uh, Quest or, or Learn or anything like that, it, it might just be that you haven't enrolled in 2FA at this time, so you should be doing that. And um, on this slide, if you just click on that link, it will take you to a web page from where you can uh, then follow the steps to uh, get that sorted out. Uh, after that, you also want to log into your What I Am account uh, to change your password and enter your recovery email. You want to then um, estimate your tuition fees. So now prior to your tuition um, and your fees being posted on Quest, which is approximately one month prior to the beginning of your admission term, you want to look up your program and in the future student program pages, you, you will basically find an estimate of your tuition and fees. So you want to get a good idea of you know, what you're going to be paying and if you need to make arrangements, uh, you can start making arrangements for um, for those funds. So any quick questions here, we'll probably have time for one question um, and then we'll have to move on. Uh, I'm just going to bring this up because again, this is a recurring theme. Uh, Sherry, can you or anybody else in the panel address fees arranged and uh, I don't know if that slide's already been covered or not, but if it hasn't, then by all means, we can hold that till then. But a lot of people have questions about uh, fees arranged and Quest showing a negative account and their ability or the lack thereof to enroll in classes, if that is the case. So for class enrollment, class enrollment hasn't started yet, right? So you are not gonna be able to do that at this point. As far as a negative balance is concerned, um, well, obviously, if you haven't paid, your balance is going to show up as a negative balance, right? I would imagine that's the way that it would work. Um, if you, and that would basically tell you that you do need to pay your balance or you need to submit your promissory note, right? So regardless, either one of those options, and again, I'm, I'm not the financial expert here. I would, uh, we would probably want to look into, um, you know, the, the financial department here and see exactly what they recommend. Uh, if we do have any specific questions or, you know, you're on a bit of a time crunch and you want to get this done, although there is time still until the due date, you can also reach out to your graduate program coordinator and just kind of connect with them on this and ask them how you should be progressing um, in regards to, to getting this sorted out as well. So I hope that kind of clarifies that. We'll also kind of, uh, Jigar, I think it might be a good idea to maybe uh, do a discussion board post about this uh, because I do think that there are going to be quite a lot of concerns regarding, you know, how to get the promissory note done and how to become fees arranged and so on and so forth. OK, so we'll uh, we'll move on. Uh, the next steps on our checklist uh, include what you should be doing after you have accepted your offer. So uh, the first thing that we recommend you do is that you should be reviewing the graduate studies academic calendar. So this is the calendar where you will find general information and regulations for graduate students along with your program requirements. So we highly recommend that you go through this academic calendar and maybe you know uh, pick on the important dates that apply to you and put them in your own calendar as well. Uh, then you can also review the GSPA's important dates of calendar uh, for administrative dates and deadlines. Um, and finally, we also recommend that you review the COVID-19 information page for graduate students as well, because, you know, just because the fact that we're living in this weird COVID-19 time, things are changing very fast. From a day-to-day -day basis, there may be new announcements that are made, or things might be moving in one direction or then moving in the other direction, depending on how things are going. Uh, you just want to be up to date uh, in regards to um, how things are changing on campus uh, and at the university. 
So um, then you want to go ahead and you want to update your personal information, including your emergency contacts in Quest. And uh, you also want to remember to keep your contact information up to date if you ever move uh, later on in your program. Lastly, you want to plan for paying your tuition at this point. So this is where you want to ensure that you are aware of the tuition and fee due date and you've made plans to become fees arranged or to pay your full term balance by the deadline. And as I said, there's two ways of doing this. You, uh, you either submit your permissory note and you become fees arranged that way, or you pay your full uh, term balance by the deadline. Uh, any questions about this particular slide? I think Naima gave a very good suggestion here. Naima, if you just want to um, say that out, so if someone misses that comment, uh, they still have an idea about it. Uh, sure, and this is about getting involved for uh, the, the teams. I think setting up a teams uh, uh, group so you can connect. Sure, yes. Um, so there was a question on getting involved uh, in a fully online program, like how do you connect with uh, other colleagues? And so I suggested setting up an online group using Microsoft Teams or another platform so that you can connect with your cohort and exchange ideas. I think that's been done in the past year when COVID hit. A lot, I've seen a lot of programs where students sort of connected over either Microsoft Teams and some even went to short social media platforms like um, Facebook and then there was LinkedIn as well. And so you can consider that. And I highly encourage attending events also, whether they're virtual or eventually in person that really provides an opportunity for you to meet people in the same program or in the same faculty or even from across the campus and, and just connect. Awesome. That's very nice advice. Thank you so much. OK, uh, so we'll move on now. After you have accepted your offer, now you are getting to a point where you are going to be matriculated, right? Or you're going to go through matriculation. So at this point, um, what what we recommend you do is if you have a preferred name, uh, like for example, my full name is Mohammed uh, Sharyar Khan, but I prefer to be called Sharyar. So at the university, I have set uh, a preferred name um, and I go by Sharyar and all of my university documents actually show um, Sharyar as, as my name. So uh, you can actually do that at the University of Waterloo um, and you can add a chosen or preferred first name um, which is the name that you would like to be referred by. Um, you can do this on the What I Am um, page uh, where you can go ahead and make this change. Now, after, uh, you know, if you are setting up a preferred name, then the next thing we recommend you do is that you set up a You Waterloo email address and you set up your Office 365 account. Now, all University of Waterloo graduate students are provided with an Office 365 account, which gives you access to OneDrive, uh, Word, Excel, PowerPoint, and all of the other good stuff that comes with it. Uh, you'll be happy to know that all graduate students also get five terabytes of cloud storage on OneDrive, which is fantastic. Like you don't really need to worry about carrying hard drives and things like that. You know, if you have that that amount of cloud storage, you're you're pretty much good to go. Um, then you want to again, I, I come back to this because uh, you know making sure that you're on top of your tuition and fees and and have them sorted out is important. So you want to review your tuition and fees. Uh, the finance office, um, so this is basically your contact point. The finance office will post your tuition fees on Quest approximately one month prior to the beginning of your ad admission term. Uh, this is if you have already fulfilled all of your requirements um, for admission and you have been fully matriculated. Now you want to go ahead and you want to pay your tuition fees or you want to become fully uh, fees arranged. Uh, and the important dates for tuition uh, and these can be found in the important dates calendar from the GSPA. Uh, after that, we recommend that you review your health and dental coverage. So graduate students who are registered in full time or part time um, regular programs are automatically included in the GSA uh, University of Waterloo health and dental plans. So ensure that you review the plans and opt in and opt out information regarding these. Now, the health and dental plans are actually very nice and they, they provide you with a lot of coverage that isn't already covered under OHIP. Um, so I definitely encourage you to go through this web page and see what's covered for you. Uh, you know, um, like I know for myself, uh, just because I've been stuck with COVID and I've been doing a lot more office work and I haven't been in the lab as much, 
um, my back hasn't really been doing well. So I've been able to kind of tap into um, the coverage that we have with the GSA and I've been able to get some physio and some massage to, to help with that. So it's, it's definitely a very, very useful um, thing for you to have. Uh, then you want to enroll in your classes using Quest. And this is once the class enrollment period has started. After this, you want to do one of the most important things that you're going to be doing, which is to be applying for your WAC card. Now, uh, there's an application form which is available for the WAC card website. Uh, if you do have a preferred name, uh, make sure that you um, update your preferred name before you apply for your WAC card. Um, and also note that the form should be filled out no earlier than six weeks prior to the start of your first academic term. Um, after this, we recommend that you add or update your banking information in Quest. So this is necessary to receive any funds that are owing to you. So for example, if you have scholarships or if the university owes you money, uh, they can actually give you this money right away rather than sending you a check, which then you know takes a while to, you know, in, in, the, in the mail and then it, you, you get it, you have to take it to the bank and then you have to kind of uh, put it in. If you have your banking information there, you'll just get a direct deposit. So that um, would be nice. Um, and also if you will be a student employee, uh, you know, in your starting term, you also want to add your Canadian banking information to Workday. Um, now, Workday is the human resources payroll system. So you want to be adding your banking information to Workday in addition to Quest. Now, any particular questions um, regarding what people should be doing after matriculation? Uh, there's a question saying, is this PowerPoint going to be posted? Yes, uh, the PowerPoint is going to be posted. Um, but I don't see any questions coming up. OK, so here's a question for Naima. I think she, she might want to jump in and answer that. So is the health and dental coverage included in tuition? Or we, we do have the opt-in and opt-out option as well, right? Yes, we do, but it's not included in tuition, so it's sort of like an ancillary fee, meaning you have to pay it separately and it will show up on your quest. If you go to your quest, you can see it's separated out from tuition and there is a change of coverage period during which you can actually choose to not pay. Now for international students, generally you wouldn't really be able to opt out of health unless if you can find an equivalent Canadian coverage within Canada, but it's usually hard. So generally international students wouldn't be opting out. But for instance, domestic students might choose to opt out if they are on a different coverage, for instance, from a different province. And so there is that option for both health and dental. Um, I do want to point out that for health, we uh, the, the, there is a requirement for equivalent coverage. However, for dental, there isn't. So for dental, anybody can opt out if they feel like they don't need that coverage. Also wanted to add, I think there was a question around what is covered in the health uh, plan. I just wanted to add and emphasize that mental health coverage is also available um, and there is no separate cost for that. That's under the health plan. Um, so yeah. Awesome. Thank you so much. So um, just going back to that dental coverage that we were talking about, um, the dental coverage for graduate students is actually very nice. You get two cleanings a year, which is spectacular, right? So um, you know, with undergrad coverage, I think it's only one cleaning a year, but the, the graduate um, service is very nice. So I definitely um, like having it and I actually enrolled my wife in it as well. So uh, we're fully covered on that front. Um, Rahul is saying I'm hoping to be on campus by mid-August. Should I apply for my walk card uh, after I'm there? So anytime, basically you, you're going to be using your walk card for services that are available uh, on campus. So you can apply for your walk card when you get to campus or you can apply for it beforehand as well, whatever you're more comfortable with. Uh, you just need it so you can access certain services while you're there, and you will also be using your WAC card as your um, public transit card. So um, you probably want to have it if you do plan on taking the bus um, to different locations. So um, yeah, we can we can post some more information about uh, when to when is a good time for you to be getting your WAC card. Just a quick update on WAC yep. card. Just know that because of COVID, uh, the WAC card office is following a different protocol than they usually do about getting your WAC card. So mm -hmm. Most of the stuff in order to get your WAT card made is done online, like submitting your photo and everything. And they don't start making your, even if you submit everything in advance, they don't start making your WAT card till you are a certain amount of time 
uh, from starting your term officially. So I went through this as I started my PhD and I was getting anxious about not getting it. So I mm -hmm. sent them an email and they said, we will start making it when you are like a month out from your term starting. Even if you like go and submit your photo right now, they're not going to start making it. So just be mindful about that and know that most of the process is online right now. Fair enough, fair enough. Thank you for that. Because um, I, I got my walk card all the way back in 2013 and I just got a new one after that when I started my graduate study. So that's very good. Thank you so much. Um, OK, so what should we be doing uh, before the term begins? Now, we are running into the last 10 minutes of this presentation, so I'm going to try to kind of speed things up a little bit over here. And as I said, like all of these resources are available online. They're available on your grad ready course. Uh, and then we'll be uh, posting this presentation as well. So if we are unable to go through any of the content uh, for this presentation, uh, this content will be available and then will be available to answer your questions afterwards as well. So right before the term begins, you want to start uh, checking your UWaterloo email on a regular basis. Now, this is because all correspondence that happens at the university will be done through your UWaterloo email address, not the Gmail address or any other email address that you put in when you started your application. So you want to kind of transition to using your UWaterloo email address as regularly as possible. Uh, you also want to check in with your department coordinator at this time just to make sure that um, all the necessary tasks uh, that you need to complete prior to the fall term uh, have been done and uh, they might have any some additional requests from you or anything like that. You just want to make sure that everything has been sorted out uh, and there are no delays in you getting uh, up to speed um, when you start your fall term. Now, you also want to keep up to date with the GSPA. They do send out emails uh, which are useful for you to go through. Uh, make sure you go through them. Uh, there is also a graduate funding and awards database. You can also go through this and see if any of the graduate funding and awards apply to you and you should be able to apply for them. Just make sure you apply to them before their deadline. And then um, uh, lastly, at this point, you really want to kind of dive in and learn more about the GSA. Um, you know, you want to review the information about the GSA services. Uh, you want to check if your department actually has a departmental GSA and reaching out to your departmental GSA can be a great way to connect with current students, right? Especially if you're having a hard time, you know, things aren't fully open um, again because of COVID or whatever, you know, it's a good way to kind of um, connect with people here. Uh, so any questions about this? Just one question. I, I don't think we have time to take more. So there is a comment here that is uh, giving me a clarification. The student financial services, I believe that's what the SFS stands for. They are no longer sending out checks uh, ever, which I mean, I personally uh, am, uh, I don't I don't mind that at all. So that would basically mean that you would need to have your banking information updated with the university if you are uh, looking to get payments back from them. OK, so what to do after the term begins? Well, first and foremost, you begin your classes. Um, so you can see the important dates, including when classes begin on the important dates calendar from the GSPA. Um, right after that, you also want to complete the graduate academic integrity module, also known as Grad AIM. You must successfully complete this learn course within the first eight weeks of the fall term. Um, it, you, you want to note that the Grad AIM course will not be available or visible to you and learn until the first day of classes, but as soon as it becomes available to you, it is highly recommended that you complete it uh, as quickly as possible. You also want to complete the mandatory safety training programs. Uh, all graduate students are required to complete three mandatory training programs, which is the employee safety orientation, uh, Women's 2015 and workplace violence uh, awareness. Uh, and then you also want to watch out for the graduate student e-news, e which is published by the GSPA. Uh, you also want to watch out for the Graduate Student Association monthly newsletter. This has important updates about services, events, uh, advocacy initiatives, including the BIPOC Collective and Organized UW Union Drive. Uh, and once you are on campus, we highly recommend taking a self-guided campus tour. Uh, so that you can kind of orient yourself to the main Waterloo campus and learn about our graduate gra grad students, uh, you know, most frequently visited places um, as well. So uh, now we come to some of the important U Waterloo systems and tools that you should be knowing. And I think this after this, we will most likely be ending uh, the presentation. So we'll just kind of uh, go deeper into 
uh, what these are. So there are a number of systems and tools that you need to be familiar with. As we already mentioned, you need to enroll in the university's two-factor authentication or 2FA service, which is powered by Duo. It is mandatory to access University of Waterloo systems such as Quest or Learn. So um, two-factor two authentication actually provides an extra layer of security to your university accounts. So what this means is that you need to verify your identity using the second factor, which could be your, your mobile device, um, and that prevents others from accessing your account, even if they know your password. So it's actually very useful as far as uh, you know, security and safety um, is concerned with your accounts. Um, if you have questions about 2FA or you run into technical difficulties, this is where you need to be contacting the IST service desk and they should be able to sort those out for you. Then we have the What I Am, which is the University of Waterloo's Identity and Access Management System. So this is the system that manages your user ID and your password. Um, after that, we have Learn, which is your online classroom learning system. So this system uh, is the one through which all of your courses and their content will be delivered. So this is where you'll access much of your course content, your assignments, your quizzes, discussion boards, um, and, and a lot of other stuff. So um, so you want, to, you want to know about LEARN. Uh, it's okay if you don't have access to it at this time or you don't see any of your courses at this time, you will have access to courses on the first day of classes. And then you should already be familiar with Quest because this is basically the system that you use to accept your offer. Um, the uh, Quest is uh, the university student, uh, university student information system. So you will use Quest to view and modify your class schedule. Uh, you will manage your fees and financial aid through Quest. You will view your final grades uh, in Quest. You will view and update your personal information. You can request transcripts through Quest. Uh, so it's very important to kind of go in Quest and figure out exactly, um, you know, all of the services that are provided on there. And then as we already mentioned, you also want to enroll uh, and download Office 365, which will give you the university's official email and then other collaboration software as well. We also have MS uh, Teams or Microsoft Teams, which is what we're using to deliver this presentation today. Uh, it's an online chat and collaboration tool. So this uh, Teams and WebEx on campus have become very important, you know, if you were doing um, uh, collaborations or you were doing online courses, uh, this is most likely where your uh, course lectures will be delivered. And then uh, finally, or one more before the final one, we have the University of Waterloo portal, which is a University of Waterloo student digital assistant. So this is a personalized app um, and website made exclusively for Waterloo students to keep you informed of campus services, events, and news to provide tailored academic uh, information in one convenient platform at your fingertips. And lastly, you have your walk card. So the walk card, as we already mentioned, is your key identification piece on campus. You will be using your walk card for a lot of different things, such as accessing library services, identif identification for exams, purchasing food, textbooks, um, and University of Waterloo clothing. Uh, you will also be using your walk card to access your student residence, uh, riding the Grand River Transit, uh, the buses and the trains around the city. Uh, if you need to be printing anything on campus, you'll be using your cards. And then you know, you'll also be using it for accessing campus recreation uh, facilities and gyms. So just because this is a very important slide and we are running out of time, I think we'll take um, a few moments to just uh, take some questions or any additional comments that the panelists might have. And then I'll just quickly show the last two, three slides that we have and then uh, our viewers can uh, watch them at a later time. I have a question uh, that is relevant to this slide from somebody that says, could you clarify what the purpose of the what I am is? And am I correct in saying, Sherryar, that the what I am is the equivalent of uh, a Google account for accessing everything that the Google family provides? And if you have, if you want to elaborate on that, you can. Okay, so that's a good question. The what I am um, is your identification system on campus. This is basically a database that the university holds, which links you as a person to your online presence at the university. So this is where you have your password. This is where you have um, you know, your user ID. This is where you can request, for example, a friendly email address, which is like, you know, if you have a, a funky email like mine, which is like MS42, uh, 
uh, K-H-A-N, you can actually kind of switch that and you can get something like shareyar.han at uwaterloo.ca. And you can do that on what I am. So I would recommend you go on to what I am. It's a very simple kind of layout. It's not very complex. It'll tell you exactly what you're able to do there. And, and you know, what you can, this is basically where you're just setting your password, right? To access the different uh, facilities that you and services that you have available online. Um, I hope that answers the question. Any other questions? Any comments, uh, ending comments from the panelists? If there's nothing, I would like to just um, add that if you are coming to campus and the Waterloo region in the fall, there is a module uh, in the Grad Ready course on Learn, module three. Um, this module has a lot of resources that you should become familiar with, which will help you to sort of transition as you come uh, and you start living here locally. So we definitely recommend going through module three in the Grad Ready course. Um, so we just provided some quick hacks uh, for success at Waterloo. This is basically just a summary of uh, pretty much everything that we covered in this presentation. So you can kind of go through that uh, on your own time. Uh, and just as an ending note, we want to remind you that we as your discipline specialists are here to help you. Um, we are here to guide you. Um, we are hosting uh, live chat sessions every week for, uh, if it's not for an hour, maybe two hours on one day. Um, and then we are also available to answer your questions on the discussion board uh, on Learn as well. Here are some academic resources that are available to you, such as the Accessibility Services of the Writing and Communication Center. Uh, and then we have additional resources listed on this slide. And, um, and with that, we come to the end of the presentation. I'd really like to take a moment to thank all the panelists for taking the time to answer a bunch of our questions. Thank you all so much. Um, if there is uh, any last comments from you guys, we'd be very happy to take them and then we'll wrap things up in the next couple of minutes. Um, I can just start with yeah. Cassandra and I just wanted to say thank you to everyone for joining the session and just encourage you to um, sort of stay connected with your colleagues and as was pointed out in the slides, officers within the department. I think if you're not sure who to ask, the grad coordinator is a great point of contact, but also the discipline specialists with student success. I mean, they are here to help you. So if you have any questions that might not have been answered during the session, feel free to reach out. Um, and when it comes to questions around admissions, quest and fees, uh, you can also reach out to the admissions officers and they're very helpful in answering those questions. So thank you. And just to add, sorry, um, if you guys have any questions after today's session, please feel free to put them on Learn. Um, there is a discussion section on Learn that can be used for that purpose. So please do that. Um, I think I'll just add um, there have been some questions about, you know, if you're in an online only program, does that really change things and, and how is that experience? And I'll say that from my experience, it's my only experience with online only programs, but it's been really fantastic. But it does require you to put in a little bit more effort to make your experience at the university what you want it to be. If you want that networking, if you want those extra experiences, they're available to you. And we can, you know, we've shown you some ways to access them, but talk to your program uh, coordinators, talk to your professors, talk to your colleagues, and there's a lot of opportunity to make this program as involved as you want it to be. Or if you don't want to get involved, that's your choice as well, but it really does help and really makes the experience so much more full and so much more applicable when you go back to your workplace. Awesome, thank you so much. Um, so with that, I think we will uh, conclude today's session. Uh, I'd like to thank everyone for attending. Um, it, was, it was fantastic presenting to you guys and uh, hopefully we were able to address some of your concerns, some of your burning questions and whatever we weren't able to get to, uh, we will definitely try to post uh, on the discussion board, uh, you know, for, for themes that we saw today, which were similar recurring questions. Uh, we'll definitely take them up again uh, and address them at a later time. So thank you all so much for attending. Take care. Have a great day. Bye.